LIGO. Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Was there any other news this week? <laughs> this, is like, this was everywhere. It's yeah. so cool. Joining us yeah. right now uh, is Alan Weinstein. He's a professor of physics at Caltech and part of the very large LIGO team. Professor Weinstein, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. What a great experiment. And I saw at one point a, like the acknowledgments for all of the people involved. This is, a, this is kind of a massive effort, isn't it? Indeed it is. There's at least a thousand people in LIGO, plus we have colleagues in, in Germany, in Italy, in England, in, in, uh, in France, in China, in Japan, in India, all over the world. So why is this important to discover? I mean, I, I guess it's cool, right? right? Yep, it's cool. <laughs> okay, that's all. Really, science, that's, is, all. Is there, that's all you need. Is there more than the coolness, though? I mean, like, what does this mean for the world? There's a lot of coolness associated with gravitational waves. What we're talking about here is a new way of listening in to the, uh, to the universe. From uh, large astrophysical objects like black holes colliding in, um, in very, very far away uh, to the Big Bang, uh, there's a kind of a vibration on space that fills the universe. We're starting to listen to it right now. And if you care about that sort of thing, then it's cool. What we're seeing in this video from the LIGO website is two black holes, right? Yeah. Dancing. That's right. Mm -hmm. They're <laughs> both about um, 30 times the mass of the sun. They're, in this case, about 1.3 billion light years away. They're orbiting each other. And as they do, they're dragging along. They're very, very strong gravitational field, strongest gravitational fields uh, in the universe. And, and they're moving so fast as they orbit each other that they're approaching the speed of light, about half the speed of light. Holy cow. And as they do that, the gravitational field is changing so rapidly that sort of the news of that change is propagating away outward um, at the speed of light. Uh, it's riding on space itself. In fact, it is ripples of curvature of space itself. So they're no. like basically the two blades on a gravitational blender, and they're and way of, <laughs> and they're way of thinking about it. That's really and they're fun. they're messing up the gravity, and then but we're trying to observe this. Uh, well, it's it's in theory, right, that that we would be able to observe these waves. It was theory until about um, a few months ago, September fourteenth, when those waves from that particular system reached our detectors loud enough to be heard by our detectors. They're gigantic L-shaped laser beam uh, or uh, laser beams. And uh, for, with those, and there's one in, in um, southern Louisiana, one in eastern Washington state. That's important, uh, right? They had to be geographically uh, distant. That's right, because we're trying to locate the sources in the sky, and it's like listening with both your ears ah. helps you to locate the source in the sky. Almost triangulating the, right. the, the location. It's very much like triangulation. We use even more information than you would use just from triangulation in order to figure out where it is in the sky. The more detectors we have, the better we can locate where these sources are coming from and do astronomy. So we want detectors like this all over the We have um, ones being built uh, and getting ready to go in Pisa in Italy, in, um, in Japan, in the Japanese Alps underneath the mountain, and we want to also put one in India. So we'll have a, a lot of different ears listening in, and we'll be able to locate the source very accurately. I've heard it described as a gravity telescope. Is that, fa is that a fair characterization? Fair enough. I mean, a telescope is something that allows you to look very far away. Um, uh, but telescopes, typically, you point them, right? You point right. them in some direction, and you see what you see in that direction. These, these things are, are more like antennas. They pick up from all directions. And because of that, you can't tell di which direction the waves come from. But if you have multiple ones, just from timing and from measuring their size and amplitude, you can figure out where they come from. All right, I'm going to show off here. A little oh. high school physics. Here we go. So <laughs> I remember Michelson and Morley figured out the speed of light using wow. it interference yep. in light waves. Am I right? Is that? I vaguely I remember dimly that. dimly remember that. <laughs> Michelson-Morley experiment, it was the inspiration for Einstein's special theory of relativity and eventually his general theory of relativity. And is this, this looks similar to the device that they created. 
very similar. It's a beautiful sort of a, um, bringing together old ideas to test new ideas. So it was the inspiration of Einstein. He went on to predict the existence of, uh, of gravitational waves 100 years ago in 1916. It took 100 years for us to finally Amazing. find them using the same devices or very similar devices to what inspired him in the first place. Yeah, it's really mind-boggling to think that that Einstein, with essentially thought experiments, uh, was able to take observations from that time, figure out kind of the underpinnings, the workings of the universe, and create this, and then we are bit by bit. Is this the last piece, really, of the puzzle to prove that he was exactly right? Um, very much so, yes. The, uh, he had, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity had a bunch of major uh, uh, predictions, including the, you know, gravity is caused by the curvature of space. That was verified uh, rather quickly. The bending of starlight, the existence of black holes. And we've had wow. um, astrophysical observations of things that, impl that suggest that these black holes really do exist but now we really know they exist. Wow. And the last big prediction was of gravitational waves, and now we know that they exist too, and th that they behave very, very much like, the, uh, like as predicted from Einstein's theory. We did very precise tests, and it's passed those tests so far. It's, wow. it's mind-boggling. So, so once you now that we've proven this piece, like what what's left? Like where did what, now that we've now that we're able to hear these waves, what can we do with it? Is it a matter just of more observation and understanding, or is this the first step towards you know being able to travel long distances or or you know more space exploration? This is science. It's you never answer a question and go home and stop. This is not the end. This is the beginning of a whole new field of astrophysics as we explore the hard the the incredibly energetic phenomena that happen in the universe that don't emit light Isn't at all amazing? and there are black holes throughout the universe there are things called neutron stars which are incredibly fascinating objects any place where you have extremely dense uh material extremely dense mass then you will have strong gravitational fields and if they're rapidly changing they produce gravitational waves we have new ears on the universe oh, i don't know what we're going to learn but it will be a lot yeah, I think a lot of times in Congress and others ask, well, what are we going to get? What's what do we the get benefit? Do yeah. we get Velcro? What do we get? <laughs> but really, true, the true nature of this is just to understand better what's going on, to continue to make progress in that. And, of course, the, there's, there's some outcome of that. But that's right. a... Silly. I mean, we don't. Why? Because. Right. I mean, it's awesome. You got to start listening to hear what might be out there. Yeah. Right. Now, Dr. Weinstein, yeah. you just. You just now. Go ahead. We've been deaf up until now, yeah. and now we can hear. And well, now we're going to start hearing. Wow. And the more things that we hear, the more we will learn about the universe around us. You may not care. If you only care about yourself, you probably won't care about <laughs> That's a good answer. You about other things? There are lots out there. You will be rewriting the textbooks. Your children will be reading about Amazing. gravitational waves. They will care even if you don't. We right. live in amazing times. You've used the word waves a couple of times. You've talked about hearing. Are these gravitational waves kind of like electromagnetic waves? Yes and no. Electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light, so do these. Electromagnetic waves can travel in a vacuum, so can these. Electromagnetic waves are vibrations in space-time. These are vibrations of space-time. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> We often talk about them using language of sound, but they are not sound. Right. Sound travels at the speed of sound, not the speed of light. Right. It's okay. much slower, and it needs a medium to travel in. In this case, space-time itself is the medium. And um, But these waves in particular, the ones that we detected with the LIGO detectors, uh, are in the audio band. And you can hear them. In wow. fact, we can take the output of our detectors, which are photo, which are photo detectors, and plug them into a speaker, and you can hear what happens when the black holes are orbiting each other, losing energy, going faster and faster and faster, and eventually smashing together and forming one single black hole. And it goes from low frequency to high frequency, from low amplitude to high amplitude, and then you get this merger into a single black hole. And it sounds sort of like this. <laughs> That's the chirp. That's the chirp. And the chirp, um, you know, going from low frequency to high frequency tells us an enormous amount about the source. It tells us the masses, the, the um, spins, the distance, the location of the, of, the, of the system. It tells us a huge amount for each individual event.
when we see lots and lots of events, we'll be able to see different systems in different stages of their lives. And as we do, we can piece together the formation and evolution wow. and history of massive stars. I'm sure there's a million questions that come That's out of crazy. this now and things that we'll be experimenting for some time. Let me just, one of the things that's so important to remember is that these are expensive, big, this is big science. Yeah. Uh, this is big science. Much like the Large Hadron Collider. These are things that don't occur, you know, by accident or some guy doing something out in his garage. This is big science. It's hard to get government to do these kinds of things, but they're often the only people with resources sufficient. This must have been a very expensive experiment. How did this even happen? You know, you have to thank the National Science Foundation for their incredible support over the years. They took a gigantic risk. There were people who said we'd never detect anything. For a while, we wondered whether they were right. Um, they sank $250 million into the initial LIGO detectors. And then once we proved that we had sensitivity, that we understood how to build these, and these are the, the most sensitive measuring devices ever built. Yeah. And once we proved that we could build things like this, we realized we ha well, we realized long before even that 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 actually detecting gravitational waves with the initial detectors would be difficult or maybe impossible, but we knew how to build better ones. And 10 years later, we were sure we knew how to build better ones. We went back and got another $200 million from the National Science Foundation to build advanced LIGO. And then within, within days or weeks of turning it on for the very first time, we saw our first event and we will be seeing more. Oh, if so you exciting. add it all up, this is something on approaching a billion dollars. Something like, um, you know, three big Hollywood blockbuster right. movies. Right, right. <laughs> Star Wars. You make Star Wars, <laughs> or... Star Wars or... One Star Wars movie. One Star Wars movie. Yeah. Or you discover the Just... origins of the universe. It's not a big deal. Um, <laughs> I want to mention that one of the science fiction. This, it's this science. is the this is yeah. real science. Yeah. Yep. One of the things thing. that you've done that's so great. Uh, if you go to uh, losc.ligo.org, this is open data. Uh, yep. They have created an IPython notebook that you can go, you can look at it, oh, you can cool. analyze it, you could do your own, you know, learning. I'm sure students all over the world will be looking at this. I love seeing stuff like this when it's available freely, you know, as open information. That is fantastic, too. You paid for it. Yeah. Well, wow. we pay go. for a lot of stuff we don't ever see. So <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. It's nice that that's open. And it was really great to talk to you, Dr. Weinstein. Thank you so much for spending time with us. You must be just on cloud nine at this point. Yeah, I'm ready to take a nap, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but my God, we live in amazing times yeah. with the Large Hadron Collider and the Higgs boson yeah. and this and so many amazing discoveries happening one after the other. I've just, it's just a thrilling time to be alive. We Thank you so much. Coming. Yeah, good. I can't wait. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Take care. Thanks. Oh, Thank that's you. so great. That's uh, Alan that's Weinstein. Amazing. He's a professor of physics at Caltech. I hear that's a pretty good school yeah, for physics. I've heard that. Some good folks there. And uh, some amazing times we live in. And yeah. you know what? Continue to. Thank the National Science Foundation to write your member of Congress to say this is great stuff. We uh, we know you know money's tight, uh, but well, when you think about the amount of money spent on other things, I mean, like he, he when he said 250 million initially, like honestly, that's that's nothing. I mean, that that's uh, what, like Apple could pay for yeah, this and a, and have lots left over. It's, it's like a 30, but, uh, one thirty second of Uber's valuation. Yeah. Let's I mean, keep yeah. doing this stuff because <laughs> it's so exciting and it makes such yeah. a big difference.